welcome everybody to today's uh, study. Um, <clears throat> as we go through the book of James, um, we're going to be going through um, chapter four uh, again today. Um, and our focus will be on verses seven through to 10. Um, but before we go on, um, I'd like us just to maybe spend a couple of minutes uh, to review what we learned last week. Um, can anybody uh, share with us maybe one or two things that they took away from what we uh, studied last week? Anyone? Um, well, one of the main things that I picked up from what we studied last week was on those evil desires that are within us and um, and how they are at work in us and the continuous need for us to submit to God's spirit so that we can produce um, we can produce the, the fruits that the Holy Spirit produces in us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Thank but you the, the main thing was the evil, evil desires that are that are within us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Sister Lee. Thanks for, for sharing that. Anybody else? Um, <clears throat> we'll go through um, verses seven to 10 today, uh, but just uh, for, for our context, I'll read again from verse one. Um, so James chapter four, uh, I'll read from verse 1 uh, right through to 10. What is causing the quarrels and fights amongst you? Isn't it the whole army of evil desires at war within you? You, what, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous for what others have, and you can't possess it. So you fight and quarrel to take it away from them. And yet, the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole motive is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy this world, you can't be a friend of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the Holy Spirit, whom God has placed within us, jealously longs for us to be faithful? He gives us more and more strength to stand against such evil desires, as the scriptures say, God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Now, verses 7 through to 10. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw close to God, and God will draw close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Verse 10. When you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on him, he will lift you up and give you honor. So we see here that uh, James continues um, in verses 7 through to 10. Um, and here he actually gives us some good recipes for Christian living. He says, we should humble ourselves before the Lord. Last week, we looked at the cause of quarrels and fights and we attributed that, as James uh, I outlined, uh, to evil desires. And we said that those evil desires 
are at war within us. At war with what? With the desires, uh, the godly desires that the Spirit of God puts in our hearts. The desire to want to follow him, the desire to want to obey him, the desire to want to live in accordance with his purpose and his plan. So we said yet last week that the evil desires are at war within us and that the fact that there is a war is an indication that we are true believers. So James uh, goes a bit further um, to give us some recipes here that we ought to pay attention to. Now, before we dig a little uh, bit uh, dig, uh, into this, I'd like us to read the book of Second Peter. Second Peter, oh, I'm sorry, First Peter chapter five. Very quickly. First Peter chapter five, um, verses five through to nine. Listen to this. It says, you younger men, accept the authority of the elders and all of you serve each other in humility. See this again. For God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Verse six. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and in his good time, he will honor you. Give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about what happens to you. Be careful. Watch out for the attacks from the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for some victim to devour. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. He says, take a firm stand. Here, James tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we see something here that James is talking about and we see almost an exact same thing um, that Peter also said in his own apostle. And that outlines the importance of these things that James is talking about, how crucial and how essential they are that we pay attention to them and observe them to be able to lead a victorious Christian journey. He says, so humble yourselves before God. Now, when we talk about evil desires, uh, last week, we said evil desires uh, can be attributed to the quarrels and fights amongst us. So James begins here by giving us an important recipe, a cure for those evil desires. You see, pride often makes us self-centered and leads us to conclude that we deserve all that we can see, all that we can touch, all that we can imagine, and it leads us to nothing more but a life full of greed. James is telling us here that humility is the cure. Humble yourselves before God. Now, what would what is humility? Um, Humility from the Miriam Webster's dictionary can be defined as freedom from pride or arrogance. It says the quality or state of being humble, freedom from pride or arrogance. And it describes arrogance as an attitude of superiority that is manifested in an overbearing manner uh, or a presumptuous claim or assumptions. So, Living a life of humility is a life that is free from pride or arrogance. Now, I want us to pay attention to certain things here. It says, so humble yourselves. Humble yourself. The responsibility for living a life of humility lies squarely with us. It is our responsibility to ensure 
that we live and lead a life that is free of pride or any form of arrogance. Now, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, places in the scriptures that actually emphasizes this. <clears throat> and I'd like us to go through them very, very quickly. Um, if we open our Bibles to the book of Second Chronicles, just very quickly, Second Chronicles, uh, we'll start from chapter 12. And we'll just read very quickly. Second Chronicles, chapter 12. Just bear with me for a quick minute. Actually, I think we should probably just go straight to chapter 32. Okay. Um, Second Chronicles 32. <clears throat> uh, let us read from verse 24. It says, uh, talking about Hezekiah, about, a time, about that time, Hezekiah became deadly ill. He prayed to the Lord who healed him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah did not respond appropriately to the kindness shown him, and he became proud. So the Lord's anger came against him and against Judah and Jerusalem. 26. Then Hezekiah repented of his pride, and the people of Jerusalem humbled themselves. So the Lord's anger did not come against them during Hezekiah's lifetime. The people of Jeremiah humbled themselves. They humbled themselves. In uh, <clears throat> Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-three, um, talking about another uh, king, uh, Manasseh. If we read from verse ten, it says, "The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they ignored all his warnings." So the Lord sent the Assyrian armies and they took Manasseh prisoner. They put a ring through his nose, bound him in brass chains and led him away to Babylon. But while in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and cried out humbly to the God of his ancestors. He cried out humbly to the God of his ancestors. 13, and when he prayed, and the Lord listened to him and was moved by his request for help. So the Lord let Manasseh return to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. So it is our duty, it is our responsibility to humble ourselves before the Lord. Okay, uh, another king in the same uh, 33rd chapter of Second Chronicles, um, if we read um, from verse 21, Ammon was 22 years old and he be, when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for two years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. He worshipped and sacrificed to all the idols his father had made. But unlike his father, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Instead, Ammon sinned even more. He did not humble himself. He did not humble himself. Second Chronicles chapter 36, very quickly. Uh, again, talking about another king, we'll read uh, Zedekiah, verse 11. Second Chronicles 36 from verse 11. It says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and he refused to humble himself in the presence of the prophet Jeremiah, who spoke for the Lord. He refused to humble himself. Now, if you read many accounts in the book of Second Chronicles, it will tell you what happened to kings who refused to humble themselves. So it tells us that the responsibility squarely falls on us to humble ourselves before the Lord. Again, very quickly, the book of Ezra, chapter 8, I will read from verses 15 through to 21. 
Ezra 8, 15 through 21. I assembled the exiles at the Haava Canal, and we camped there for three days while I went over the list of the people and the priests who had arrived. I found that not one Levite had volunteered to come along. So I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jerib, Elnathan, Nathan, Zachariah, and Meshulam, who were leaders of the people. I also sent for Joariab and Elnathan, who are very wise men. I sent them to Edo, the leader of the Levites at Kasifia, to ask him and his relatives and the temple servants to send us ministers for the temple of God at Jerusalem. Since the gracious hand of our God was on us, they sent us a man named Sheribiah, along with 18 of his sons and brothers. He was a very astute man and a descendant of Mali, who was a descendant of Levi, son of Israel. They also sent Hashbabaiah, together with Jeshiah from the descendants of Merari, and 20 of his sons and brothers, and 220 temple servants. The temple servants were assistants to the Levites, a group of temple workers first instituted by King David. They were all listed by name. And there, by the Ahava Canal, I gave orders for all of us to fast and humble ourselves before our God. Daniel, Daniel chapter five, very quickly. Daniel chapter five, and we'll read verses 13 through to 22, very, very quickly. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, are you Daniel who was exiled from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you and that you are filled with insight, understanding and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read this writing on the wall, but they cannot. I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor and you will wear a gold chain around your neck. You will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts or give them to someone else, but I will tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God gave sovereignty majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were hardened with pride, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of an animal and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow, and he was drenched in the dew of heaven until he learned that the most high God rules the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself. For you have defied the Lord of heaven and have these cups from his temple brought before you. Yet, you have not humbled yourself. So we see here, in many places in scripture, as James has said, so humble yourselves before God. The responsibility to lead a life of humility that is free of pride or any form of arrogance rests squarely with us. Humble yourselves before God. Why is humility such a crucial character in the life of a saint? Well, there's a lot of evidence in scripture in terms of why this is important. Um, we don't have time to go through probably all of the scriptures, but I will read them. In uh, Psalm 18 and verse 27, the Bible tells us that God rescues the humble. Psalm 18, 27, God rescues the humble. In Psalm 25 and verse 9, the Bible tells us that he leads the humble. In Psalm 69 and verse 32, he walks on behalf of the humble. Psalm 138 and verse 16, he cares for the humble. In Psalm 147 and verse 16, he supports the humble. In Psalm 149 and verse 4, the Bible tells us that God gives victory to the humble. So if we humble ourselves before God, 
there's a lot of things that God does for the humble. So humble yourselves before God. And in Proverbs 3 and verse 34, the Bible tells us that he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. That is the scripture that James was talking about here in verse 6. It says, as the scriptures say, God sets himself against the proud, but he shows favor. He shows favor to the humble. In the book of Proverbs chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 16 to 19, uh, the Bible tells us about seven things that God hates. The very first item on that list, I think we should read it. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. Um, if somebody can read for us. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through to 19. Can somebody read for us? Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. Naughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that raise to do wrong, a false witness who, who pours out lies, a person who so discord in family. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. The very first item on that list is haughty eyes. The word haughty is actually a synonym for pride. Some translations will say a proud look. It signifies a life full of pride. So humility, <clears throat> as we see in the book of James here, is offered here as a recipe, a cure for evil desires. You know, when we look back at what happened in heaven, the devil was thrown out of heaven because of rebellion. Why? That rebellion was deeply rooted in pride. So, because of pride, there was no place for the devil to remain in heaven. So also, God will be far from anybody who lives a life full of pride or any form of arrogance. But the humble will always be close to God. Okay, so we'll uh, proceed here. So, so humble yourselves before God. Then watch the next thing. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. It says first humble yourself before God. Then resist the devil. So we see here, the order in which James puts these exhortations for how we can actually live a life that is more in line with godly desires. Only the humble can really resist the devil. See, this is why James is telling us here, first humble yourself then resist the devil. Only the humble can actually really resist the devil. Why? Well, you see, a person who is proud or arrogant already is a decorated officer in the devil's army. He, he's already in the devil's camp. <laughs> so, um, for you to be able to resist the devil, you have to actually live a life of humility. Humbling ourselves before God, it means submitting to his authority. Anybody who is proud is already taking the playbook of the enemy, of the devil. 
Living a life of humility means submitting to the will of God, committing our life to him and his control, and being willing to follow him. Now, to follow him, whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. You see, this is why the Lord just said, you know, we should count the cost. Only a humble person can really resist the devil. Now, what does resisting the devil mean? What does it actually entail? Resisting the devil means not allowing the devil to entice us or tempt us. You know, the enemy sometimes will make very strong deceitful arguments for why we should do something that we know clearly God has commanded us not to do. The enemy did that back at Eden. When God told Adam and Eve, you know, every other food here you can eat, but there's one that you mustn't. What did the enemy do? He went and talked to Eve and said, well, you know, if you eat this, you shall surely become like God. He made very strong arguments. And based on that, there became a desire in Eve, an inappropriate desire to actually eat that fruit. You know, Eve could have said, I don't care whatever things you said. I don't care whether it's sweet or it's not sweet. I don't care whatever reason the Lord has told us not to eat it. it that's the Lord's commandments, and that's what I'm sticking by, period, end of story. That didn't happen. Um, almost before Jesus fully began his ministry, the devil did the same thing. And I'd like us actually to read that encounter. In the book of Matthew, chapter 4, in the book of Matthew chapter 4, very, very quickly. Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through to 11. When Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted, there by the devil, for 40, sorry, then Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he ate nothing and became very hungry. Then the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, change these stones into loaves of bread. Then Jesus told him, no. The scriptures say, People need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, even quoting the scriptures, he orders his angels to protect you, and they will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, do not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him the nations of the world and all their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will only kneel down and worship me. Verse 10, get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God. Serve only him. Verse 11. Then the devil went away and angels came and cared for Jesus. So we see here, just as James said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You see, a person has not shown true obedience 
if he or she has never really had an opportunity to disobey, yet choose the path of obedience. A person has not really demonstrated their integrity until a, they have an opportunity to be dishonest and nevertheless, they choose to maintain their integrity. We see here how the enemy operates, how the enemy operated at Eden and using the exact same playbook here. So when James tells us to resist the devil, what James is in effect saying is that we should not allow ourselves to be enticed or tempted by the enemy. Resist the devil. Peter actually puts it in a very interesting way. In that scripture we read from 1 Peter chapter 5, I will read that again. Verse 9, take a firm stand against him. I will read from verse 8. It says, be careful. Watch out for the attacks from the, from the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for some victim to devour. Look at verse 9. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This account in Matthew that we just read, you will notice that the enemy played to real needs. I mean, somebody who hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights will be very hungry. Very, very hungry. So it wasn't that there wasn't a real need. Oftentimes, the enemy will also tread on doubts. Will God provide? If God is not providing, why don't you turn this bread, these stones into bread? Turn these stones into bread. When he took Jesus to the highest point of the temple, says, if you are the son of God, jump off. Even quoted the scripture. For the scripture says, he orders his angels to protect you and they will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. What is the physical need there? Security. Security. Would God protect him? And in the last place, we see what the enemy is trying to do there. The need for power, for recognition, for achievement. You know, all these kingdoms will become yours. You know, just bow down and worship me. So when we are tempted, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is not a genuine need. But we are told here, or we are exhorted here by James, to resist the devil. So if we have an opportunity to be dishonest, we should choose to be honest. Because that is the only thing that can actually tell what we have within us. Who we really choose to follow. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay, let's go ahead. Verse 8, another recipe. Draw close to God and God will draw close to you. Now, note what it says here. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. Now, I thought this epistle, I mean, this letter was written to Jewish Christians. Why is he calling them hypocrites? Why? How do you draw close to God? 
so that God too can draw close to you? The answer is by leading a pure life. Psalm 24 tells us who can stand in God's holy hill. Uh, we'll read that very quickly. The book of Psalm, chapter 24. Uh, we'll read from verses 3 through to 6. Psalm 24. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure. Who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have right standing with God, their Savior. They alone may enter God's presence and worship the God of Israel. Only those whose hands and hearts are pure. So James is giving us a recipe here for how to draw close to God. So he's telling us, if you draw close to God, God will draw close to you. How do you draw close to God? Wash your hands and purify your hearts. In other words, lead a life of purity. Now, there are two important concepts that it says here. Wash your hands, purify your hearts. What James is telling us here is that for us to lead a true life of purity, there must be heart-hand alignment. So in other words, the hand stands for our works. And our works must show who we truly believe in. But it must come from the right motive. Our motives for doing the things that God has commanded us to do must be right. That is why he said, you hypocrites. You know who else the scriptures calls hypocrites? The Pharisees. Jesus said in, in the, if we read many accounts in the Gospels, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why? They did a lot of very good things. The Pharisees, for example, prayed a lot. But where did they pray? Why were they praying? That's a different story. You know, when Jesus said that our righteousness must exceed that of the, right, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, what that basically said to us was that we ought not only to do the right thing, but we have to do it with the right motive. Not everyone giving to the poor is giving with the right motive or for the right reason. Some people may give truly because there's a need. They feel a compassion. God has blessed them so much and they are willing to share what the lord has given them with people who may be in need the lord wants us to have compassion on the poor on the weak some other people may also give for recognition so that people can know that oh they truly have very similar works very different motives So James is exhorting us here, says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. When we do the right thing for the wrong motives, that makes us hypocrites. God always sees the heart. God sees our reason and our motives for doing anything so as we read in the book of psalm who can really really 
ascend to God's holy hill. Who? So it tells us very, very importantly that only those whose hands and hearts are pure, purity of heart, having the right motives, and extending out in the right works. Okay, so drawing close to God requires leading a life of purity. We see here another recipe for how to battle evil desires. Okay, we'll go ahead. Verse 9. Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Now, what does this really mean? It talks here about sorrow and deep grief. Now, I'd like us to open our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. The Paul's second epistle to Corinthians, chapter 7. And I will read here from verses 1 through to 11. 2 Corinthians, um, chapter 7. I will read from verses 1 through to 11. And reading from the New Living Translation, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. And let us walk together. Let us walk towards complete purity because we fear God. Please open your hearts to us. We have not done wrong to anyone. We have not led anyone astray. We have not taken advantage of anyone. I'm not saying this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts forever. We live or die together with you. I have the highest confidence in you, and my pride in you is great. You have greatly encouraged me. You have made me happy despite all our troubles. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. Outside, there was conflict from every direction. And inside, there was fear. But God, who encourages those who are discouraged, encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. His presence was a joy, but so was the news he brought of the encouragement he received from you. When he told me how much you were looking forward to my visit and how sorry you were about what had happened and how loyal your love is for me, I was filled with joy. Verse eight, I am no longer sorry that I sent that letter to you, though I was sorry for a time, for I know that it was painful for you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to have remorse and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. So you are not harmed by us in any way. Now look at verse 10. For God can use sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek salvation. We will never regret that kind of sorrow, but sorrow without repentance is the kind that results in death. Just see what this godly sorrow produced in you. Such earnestness, such concern to clear yourselves, such indignation, such alarm, such longing to see me, such zeal, and such a readiness to punish the wrongdoer. Excuse me. You showed that you have done everything you could to make things right. Now, Paul is talking here about a sorrow 
that turns people away from sin. So when we have true remorse, when we come to the knowledge of the effects of the things that we have done and the effects on the lives of other people, that sorrow can turn us away from sin. So this is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 7 through to 11. It says, God can use sorrow in our lives to help us turn from sin and seek salvation. Now, how did we all accept? How did we come to the point where we accepted the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We came to the knowledge that we are sinners. We came to the knowledge of how wicked we truly have been. And we came to the knowledge of the Lord that God demonstrated towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ even died for us. And we grieved and became sorrowful over the wickedness that our own belief and our disposition has caused. Despite the Lord showing that much love. James is saying here, again, giving us another recipe, that for us to live a godly life, we must allow sorrow and deep grief to work its way in us to turn us from sin. To, for that remorse, true, genuine remorse, to help us to change our ways. It says, let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of of joy. As we come to the knowledge of God, as we study his scriptures, as we come to light of things that we have done or things that we may be doing, there is an important step that we as believers always need to take, which is to make the right amendments and follow God's commandments. This is the work that the Spirit of God does in us. The Spirit of God will convict us of our sins. The Spirit of God will show us and give us godly desires. And it is our responsibility when we have and when we come to this knowledge of the wrong things that we have done or that we may still be doing, that that sorrow and that grief for what these things may have even done is enough to turn us from the evil that we have perpetrated or that we're perpetrating to the paths of righteousness. Let there be tears for the wrong things you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. As we have seen here in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul was very, very happy at what his letter was able to do in the lives of uh, the believers at Corinth. And he's telling us here that God can use sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek salvation. James is emphasizing here the importance of what this can truly accomplish. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, in verse 10, it goes ahead. It says, when you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on him, he will lift you up and give you honor. I think we'll, we'll wrap up to this um, study with verse 10. Here we see the results. So, if we humble ourselves before God, 
Next, we resist the devil. The devil flees. Okay. We draw close to God. And he draws close to us. Making sure that our hearts are pure. And our hands are washed. And we allow godly sorrow and grief to work its way in us through to repentance. It says, when you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on him, he will lift you up and give you honor. A person who is humble only has one place to go. And that is up. That is up. Um, we are admonished to humble ourselves so that God will not humiliate us. There is a scripture, actually. Um, I'd like us to read the, this very, very importantly. Um, it's in the book of uh, Psalms. Um, and admit your dependence on him. In other words, if you humble yourself before him, he will lift you up and give you honor. So a person who is humble only has one direction they can go, which is to go up. And that is what James is saying here. In God's own time, he will lift you up and he will give you honor. So, um, we see here, just to wrap up uh, for today, uh, James goes a step further by giving us certain recipes for which we can actually address the problem of evil desires. By which we can live and lead a, a true and a successful Christian life. It starts with a life that is free of pride and arrogance. And James admonishes us here to humble ourselves. To humble ourselves. We are admonished also to resist the devil. To not allow the devil to entice us or tempt us. We are admonished here to draw close to God so that God can draw close to us as well. And how do we do that? By washing our hands and purifying our hearts. And James is also telling us here that we should allow godly sorrow, godly sorrow to work its way in us, to lead us to repentance to lead us to change our ways, to lead us to lead, leave the paths of unrighteousness and to obey God's commandment, to follow God's plan and purpose and to accomplish what he has said to accomplish in our lives. And if we do all of these things, when you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on him, when we admit our dependence on him by doing these things in his time, he will lift us up and he will give us honor. My prayer uh, for us is to today uh, is to consider these things that we have read. Uh, next week, we will wrap up um, the remaining uh, verses in uh, the fourth chapter of uh, James's letter. 
uh, and we will see uh, other items that James uh, will talk to us about uh, in terms of how to continue to lead a victorious Christian life. And uh, for, with this, I would like uh, to bring today's study to an end and uh, open it up to the floor for any contributions, any questions, and um, any additions. Thank you, sir. Wow. Today's dose is heavy, but that is the weight of truth. Truth is not like we always say, it's not like a one soup that we enjoy. Truth does two things. It convicts and it comforts. Um, a true biblical teaching points light on our dark spot, not to condemn us, but to see where we should make amendment and where we should change. If you look at the sky during the day, if you look at the sky during the day, the stars are still there, but we can't see them. All the stars we see beautiful at night, shining at us, are there 247, but we can't see them because there's so much light during the day, and that makes the stars not to be conspicuous. We live in a time where preachers paint the good part of man. You are beautiful. You are more than this. Now, we do have problem of sin. We just make mistakes. And these words has made us to be blind to our own hypocrisy. Teachings like that have not made our hypocrisy to be conspicuous. I don't know who is innocent from this series today, from this teaching. And maybe at one point there has been, there are, maybe at one point we've done things that our hand agree with, but our hearts did not agree with. I don't know if there's anyone like that who is not guilty of that. I don't know if there's anyone here who has not made Boastful statement, like we command things, we speak, we speak to realities, I speak forth, I decree and declare. Many of us have done that, either knowingly or unknowingly, because to, so, to humble ourselves here means to submit to the authority of God. True gospel is like the way they sell gold. For the gold to be conspicuous, it's displayed on a black suede. The black suede brings out the beauty of the gold. True gospel paints the reality of man. And today, this class has painted the reality, has painted our reality. At times, we do things with our hand that our heart does not agree with. Many times, we are proud of ourselves. So, is it that after a class like this, we should ask questions or we should pray? I would rather choose that we pray because I don't know who is innocent. But then, thank God for his mercy and grace, because there's comfort in God, and there's also conviction in God. There's delight in God, and there's also discipline in God. But the father, the child the father loves, he corrects. So let's take today's teaching as a correction from a loving God and a loving father, who is pruning us, who is cutting us into shape. So we'll be like his very son, we'll be like Christ, indeed. So I just want us to pray. Now, God, we, watch, we search our heart. A broken and a contrite heart, the Lord will not resist. See, God does not want perfect man. He just wants a man that can confess. Adam sinned. David sinned. One went into blaming game. The other one cried into repentance. And a loving father forgave David. They did the same thing. Broke the law. Both of them were proud. Both of them went outside the conference, circumference of the commandment. But well, God forgave David because he cried to repentance. Of course, Adam was ticked out because we'll play, he was playing the blaming game. So let us pray for forgiveness. Let us pray for God's mercy in whichever area of our life we have been proud. Proud to our spouse, proud to our siblings, proud to our children, proud to our parents, proud to our co colleagues at work. When we say we can't, we deserve more than this. I am more than this level. When we look highly of ourselves, Father, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. When we look at those who are in Nigeria as below us because we find ourselves in Europe or America or Canada, we look at ourselves as better off. 
some even some even vilify those who are in Nigeria and say those Nigerians. Why? Because you, are, you find yourself in a much better country. The country doesn't make who we are. We are God's children. We are empty clay. What makes the difference is the fact that we have the Holy Spirit. Father, forgive us our sins, in whichever area we might have wronged you, in whichever area of our life we might have been proud, unknowingly forgive us. Even when we deliberately come live a proud life, Father, please forgive us. Help us to accept, even when we are wrong, help us to be humble. Even when we are right, help us to be humble. Help us, teach us how to sacrifice our right to be right. A true believer don't prove point all the time. Yeah, I'm right. It's my right. Yeah, it's your right. But we are a believer. And we are children of God. Help us, Lord, to live a humble life. And also deliver us from hypocrisy that we have inherited from our previous religious view. Hypocrisy is a kind of culture to us. Help us, Lord, to do good for your sake and for your glory. Help us, Lord, not to be like the Pharisees. Who we'll pray, but for a reason. Who we'll give, but for a reason. Who we'll do everything for, but for a selfish reason. Father, we were taught to give, to get. Even though we have changed, we have repented, but this thing still comes back to us. When we help people, we don't give for giving sake. We give because we've been corrupted. That giving opens the door. And our eyes are on that door, not on the giving. That makes us hypocrites. Help us, Lord, to overcome hypocrisy. The teacher today said, our heart, our heart, hand and heart must be in alignment. Help us do your good for your reason, for your good reasons alone. Wash us clean, Lord, Father, we ask today. That with the world we see us and see your glory in us. That moving forward, we will lead a life, a life of righteousness, a life of humility, particularly to our spouses. For those who are proud to their spouses, maybe because your career is higher, you make more money than your husband, or your husband make more money than the wife. And as a result of that, you became haughty. We don't want to be against you, oh Lord, our God. Help such family listening to us now and we will listen to us afterwards. Help us to be humble so that you don't humble us because you love us and you don't want us to destroy ourselves. We don't want to be against you, Father. The teacher today said, to be humble means to accept wherever it's leading. Jesus was hungry. So it's not turning stone to bread. It means at that point, it was going to be hungry. Help us, Lord, we need grace. Because at times the temptation comes from our legitimate needs, legitimate reasons. Some, many of us, we face this daily. Father, help us. We ask for your grace. That the legitimacy of the need will not make us to forget you. Because there's no excuse for breaking your commandment. So Lord, we need your help. Doing in us what you did in Paul. Give us a grace inside and give us a grace to work it out so that our hand and our heart will be in perfect alignment. And at the end, everything will be pointing to you and to your glory. Help us, O oh Lord, that all these words will not stand against us in judgment. Help us, Lord. Help everyone listening and all will listen afterwards. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Brother Paul, for that prayer. Thank you, Brother Allah. That was, that, was, that was a heavy dose. But you see, one of the things that came to my mind while this Bible study was going on is, please, let us um, learn to forgive people that have wronged us in one way or the other. And why am I saying this? You see, if you have not been exposed to this kind of teaching, how can we live a good life in Christ? If the Bible has not been broken down in pieces, I, I was telling Brapo during the week, I, 
I doubt from the country I came from, any church would do a series on, on James and teach it line by line. Because, so when you see people behave in a way that is far from what they profess as Christians, don't be upset. It's not their fault. They have not been fed. It's like I've never had anything on humility, on temptation to before in my life except today. That was how heavy it came. And that's why I wrote here that don't interrupt this teaching, just reserve everything to the end. And I just want to say thank you to you, Brother Lan. I think even for you, this, this is, a, is, is a heavy one. Because you would have been processing this for days to now come and give us today. So it has cost, it would have cost you a lot of time for reflection to think over this, go over it. And all those references you were reading about the kings, they were not humble. I was just thinking, and the Paul letter wrote, the letter Paul wrote in, was it in Second Corinthians? We were Second reading. Corinthians. Before I was sorry, but now I'm no longer sorry about this. I'm not sorry thinking. about it. Huh? It's the word of God, and it can only be God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, sir. Amen. I'm not going to say any other thing other than thank you. So don't expect me to say anything. Just thank you. <laughs>